Hi, I'm Wes, the Explosion, and this is the Backlog. I tackled two late novels this week, the first being Little Witch Academia, The Nonsensical Witch, and The Land of the Fairies, by Momo Tachibana, with illustrations by Iku Yukira. The story is about a girl, Akko, and her two friends, Latte and Susie, and, as you would likely imagine, they go to a school for witches, Luna Nova, and get up to magical shenanigans. Akko herself isn't very good at magic, but tries her best to become a witch due to a show she saw as a child performed by her idol, Shiny Chariot. The book is based off the anime from Studio Trigger. They're my favorite animation studio, so I try to watch everything they put out. This is the third time I've delved into this world, so why don't we talk about the other two iterations I've experienced first, then see how this one stacks up. Little Witch Academia was originally a pair of OVAs, or original video animations, that were made for Netflix or at least purchased as exclusives for that in the United States. The first deals with a treasure hunt and the second with a nighttime parade, but the stakes escalate in each when a powerful malevolent magical being shows up. It has been quite a while since I've watched the set of videos, but I remember them charming the heck out of me. The art style is beautiful and the story is whimsical. The cast of characters are likable, most being a simple archetype. The main character is brash but kind, the best friend is bookish and shy, and the rival is rich and good at everything. For a children's movie, especially a short one, this works great because it makes each of them easy to understand and you don't need to take much of the very limited runtime to build them up. This doesn't work as well in a 25 episode series. Many of the characters feel flat and in some cases develop even less than in the two short films that came before. They also changed my favorite character Susie's personality quite a bit, though she's still probably the best, just in a much different way. Rather than being episodic, like the original work, it has an overarching plot that's pretty boring and forgettable. In this alternate timeline, Akko is still a witch in training at Luna Nova, but she can't use magic for some reason. She finds a special magical rod that belongs to her idol, Shiny Chariot, which allows her to use some spells in specific situations, and she needs to collect the seven shine sparks or whatever to power it back up and do something. I don't think she even knows until the end of the series, and I can't remember. The whole series is just full of cliches and predictable turns, and the production values also seem to be down considerably. After the high point of the OVAs, this was a major disappointment. I guess what I'm saying is, watch the movies, avoid the TV series. As for the book, it seems to take place sometime during the TV plot. However, it is a standalone story and can be read without any prior knowledge, which kinda saves the entire thing. The whimsy is back and so is most of the charm. Akko and the students of Luna Nova take a field trip to the door of the fairy world to bask in the full moon due to its magical properties, but are sternly warned against entering the portal. When the newly christened guardian of the door refuses to show herself to the teachers and renew their working relationship with the school, Akko and her friends seek her out on their own and are tasked with tracking down her companions, a cat and a dog. The plot unfolds from there, the fairy world may or may not be visited, there may be more to the Guardian's request than meets the eye, and overall, it's just a very charming and magical adventure. There are also illustrations throughout that are true to the animation's art style, which further increase the appeal. It's a good book to read to a child, or on your own if you're also an Art and Trigger fan like I am. Then, on the other end of the spectrum is the very much not for children's book, J.K. Haru is a Sex Worker in Another World, by Ko Hiratori. And it was the name. The name is what got me. It's just so crass and says so much, but here it was plastered across the cover. From what I could tell, it was a single volume series with one other book that was just side stories, so I figured it was low commitment enough that if I picked it up when I was looking for light novels to read, it wouldn't hold me up long. I guess going into it that it would either be a hit or a miss with me, and fortunately, it was a hit. So, to explain the premise, it's pretty much a unique take on isekai, which is a genre for the uninitiated, where an ordinary person from a world like ours gets sent to a fantasy one. One where, in many cases, acts like an RPG with stats and levels to boot. In this instance, a kid named Chiba tries to save a girl, Haru, from an out-of-control truck and both die, 
getting sent to another world, and Chiba gets a powerful set of skills from its god. He sets out to get stronger and become the hero of the world. Given the cliches of the genre, you'd expect the book to follow him, but instead, the main character, the story being told from the first person, is Haru, who becomes a prostitute. Unfortunately, the world they're sent to is super misogynistic, and that's really the only work she can find for herself. The story follows her as she adjusts to the world, build relationships, and improves at her job, slowly learning to take pride in it even as she resents the world that looks down on her for doing it. There are some 18 plus scenes throughout, as some of Haru's clients use her, abuse her, or even be actually affectionate with her. The whole thing reads like a scathing rebuke against misogyny, with some of the characters in the male-dominated world being downright disgusting, while the ones that actually treat Haru as a human being are shining examples of humanity, even in the setting of a brothel. The characters themselves are another strong point of the book, several of them being quite likable and others being super hateable, providing a nice contrast. Haru herself is cool and collected, keeping on a facade of affability while performing her duties, even as she internally curses some of her clients and the world at large. She constantly tries her best and innovates, and as time goes on, she tries to improve the world, not just for herself, but for those like her. Her biggest flaw is that, despite not having a self-esteem problem, she constantly underestimates her worth and doesn't even notice some of the waves she makes. Another character, Sumo, is bashful but sweet, showing strength at key moments and you hope good things happen to him. Chiba is a bit of a mixed bag. He's arrogant because of his god-gifted skills and refuses to work hard. He gives the impression that, in any world other than this, he would be an incel and slowly learn to hate women, but there is a point in the story that does explain pretty well why he is the way he is. I still don't think I like him, but I can at least understand where he's coming from a bit. As I said, the book largely follows Haru as she works as a prostitute, but there is world building, relationship building, shenanigans, more typical fantasy action, and surprises in store. Overall, I really enjoyed my time with this. Originally, I thought this was one volume, like I said, with another book of side stories, so I was kind of wondering if that was going to cover some of the things that this book left open. I probably would have been fine if it didn't, since I think the story made its point and I would have been content letting my mind wander on the subject of the larger story. I think the smaller tale in the vaster world was what gave this title some of its charm, after all. However, when looking up some information to do this review, I learned that a second volume is up for pre-order, so some of those hanging threads might be covered after all, which I won't complain about. I'll probably order the side stories in the near future and look forward to the future release of the second book after that. So in the end, this book gets a very tentative recommendation. Sure, I loved it, but it's one of those very specific tastes sort of thing. First, you have to be old enough to read an 18 plus book. Then, you have to be open to adult stuff. On top of that, you also have to be willing to deal with some pretty disgusting stuff, both in the traditional sense and the moral one. Also, the book is Japanese in origin, so while being a weeb isn't required, it does certainly help. If you meet those specifications though, you're in for a unique read. Then, for actual gaming content, I played Tetris 99. There is a Mario Golf event, and I try to collect all the themes, I'm only missing one, so I jumped on to take part. Up till now, I've yet to get a first place, my best being either third or fourth, and that still hasn't changed. While I think I'm slightly above average, I'm certainly no pro. The competition seemed especially fierce here. At one point, someone was dropping lines faster than I could clear them, and I was getting at least one clear per Tetramino. I didn't know how this was possible, so I made the mistake of looking up whether people cheat in Tetris 99, and was told that yes, they do. I imagine with many online games, of course they do, and Nintendo is notoriously bad at catching them. Just look at Splatoon. And much like Splatoon, as soon as I confirmed it, I started viewing everyone who was kicking my butt with suspicion. This was obviously a mistake, since I was much happier playing the game before learning that cheating was possible. It's like a boogeyman, constantly lurking in my online connection. Let's be real, I'm just not as good as I could be at Tetris, so chances are, the people beating me were just way better. Just now I planted the seed of doubt and can never be happy again. So yeah, Tetris 99 rules, I've ruined it for myself, and just play for the love of Tetris.
I also practiced a lot of Smash. I still have no idea how good I am compared to the general player base. I watch my brother play, and I see him pull off impressive moves that make me feel inadequate, but then he struggles against level 9s. I, on the other hand, can beat 9s pretty consistently, but then again, sometimes they just randomly get the Berserker Rage, chase me off the stage, and edgeguard me to oblivion. I could try online to gauge it, but I play consistently worse online, likely due to input lag. It sounds like an excuse, but I have one guy I play against that, in person, I beat over 90% of the time. Online though, I'd say he wins slightly over half the time, which I think is enough of an indicator that the ping is screwing me over. I played with a group of people over the weekend with mostly 6 player smash, which is a chaotic mess, but I got at least 2nd most of the matches and ended with the most KOs. But I lost some of the one on ones I thought were gimmies and kills don't necessarily mean much given that that just means you hit last, not hit most or hardest. So Smash still leaves me in an existential crisis, since I have no idea how I rate, but I think I am getting at least slightly better. So there. Nintendo also announced the Switch OLED model, and opened up pre-orders, which I missed, because one retailer emailed me and I saw it 30 minutes later, and another did them while I was at work. It's not the biggest deal in the world though. The new model has a bigger, more efficient screen, more memory, though still not a lot, a port for an ethernet cable, better sound, and an improved stand. While nice, it's not required to play any games. It's not like some of the late 3DS games that you could play on older models, but it chug along and almost died if you weren't using the latest model. It's one of those things I want, but don't need. I won't go out of my way to get it, and I never pay scalper prices. So if I happen to come along one in the wild, I'll pick it up. Otherwise, I can deal. Which is why I'm fairly happy to say that while the online pre-order sold out immediately, the GameStop closest to where I work still had in-store ones open, so I have one reserved. I already have a red and blue with black dock model, so I went with the white one to differentiate. I'm pleased that I have one lined up and I'll probably talk more about it once it actually drops. Hopefully I can get the Metroid Dread Amiibo, which launched the same day. Speaking of which, wasn't there another Amiibo I was looking for? Oh yeah, Skyward Sword HD launched this week, along with the Zelda and Lopwing amiibo. And no one has them, other than scalpers. To be clear, I hate Skyward Sword, I have no intention of ever playing it again, and only want this amiibo because I have every other first party figure amiibo, not counting special editions given away in tournaments and contests. I kinda hate everything about this. Skyward Sword sucks, so they put in a quality of life improvement to make it not suck only need an amiibo to unlock it. And that amiibo is $10 more expensive. And they only sold it online, so only a lucky few and bots were able to buy it. I do not understand. Sure, making things scarce makes people panic buy and you sell out quickly, but do the impulse buys from this really outweigh how many you'd move if you made enough for the people who just want them without the FOMO? Also, you look like an asshole. We want the thing. Why will you not sell us the thing? Why will you not sell us the thing and then get mad when we go through devious means to get the thing? Really, this only seems to benefit the scalpers which, unless the scalpers have moles inside the company, doesn't make any sense. Sometimes, it just seems like Nintendo does so much for us. Other times, they pull crap like this and it seems like they're openly showing contempt. Part of me feels silly complaining about Nintendo not selling me a hunk of overpriced plastic I'll probably just keep stashed away in a drawer when so many other companies in the video game realm, no less, are doing some morally, reprehensible, and even illegal things. Part of me thinks that a bad thing is still a bad thing though. Cause yeah, if others are going around pillaging and murdering, and someone comes out and pisses on your shoes before running away, you could shrug it off and think, at least I wasn't pillaged and or murdered. Or you could think, well things could be worse, that guy still just pissed on my shoes. What the hell? Who does that? I really, really, really like Nintendo, so I expect better, but that's probably just wishful thinking. But I can still dream, right? And I can still be disappointed that I didn't get the stupid amiibo, right? That'll do it. Mostly book stuff. Maybe more video games next week. Thanks for watching. Maybe subscribe if you enjoy this sort of thing. And perhaps I'll see you next week.